February 1. Uh, it's 9 a.m. Pacific time, and I'm delighted to be opening another global immuno talk. I'm uh, here with uh, one of the co-organizers, Carla Rodlin, and our fantastic speaker today, uh, Dr. Maria Yasdambach, uh, that will be introduced by Carla. So, thank you. Thank you, Elena, and welcome everybody to a new Global Immunotalk. Uh, indeed, I am absolutely delighted to introduce today Maria Yasamba. Uh, Maria is the head of parasitology and a board member at Leiden University Center of Infectious Diseases in the Netherlands. And I've learned today that Maria is from Germany, but she then moved uh, to uh, England where she did her master's at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. After that introduction, I guess, to this area of research, she continued her studies and did her PhD at the University of Amsterdam, where she studied the immunobiology of human eosinophils. She studied uh, their response to different bacterial derived products to their bactericidal functions. And I would imagine that probably this sparked her interest in infectious diseases and what became more the focus of her current studies, which are parasitic infections. Now, what's really special about Maria is that uh, her interest and commitment to understanding the immune response to parasitic infections led her to establish what turned out to be long-standing international collaborations. Maria has been a visiting professor at the Medical Research Center of Lambarene in Gabon for more than a decade and she's also a visiting professor at the University of Indonesia. Now it is through these collaborations that Maria contributed to the training of very many medical and biomedical researchers who obtained their PhD at Leiden University and then moved back to their countries to continue to contribute to scientific research. And Maria has also worked very closely with her colleagues in Gabon and Indonesia to build the infrastructure infrastructure, sorry, needed for these collaborative studies. Now, through decades of work in these uh, countries, she has combined a state-of-the-art technology platforms to define the immune response of humans to various parasites, including protozoans and helminths. I'm sure we're going to learn much more today about this in her talk. Now, Maria has received multiple recognitions, including being elected as a member of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences just now in 2020. And she is currently the president of the Dutch Society of Parasitology. Maria, on a personal note, I remember listening to you for the first time at a Quisto meeting in Santa Fe, New Mexico. This was almost like a decade ago. And I remember being very impressed by your approach and commitment to study these neglected infectious diseases. So I'm delighted to introduce you today. I'm very much looking forward to your talk entitled Dissecting the Interaction of Parasites with the Immune System. Is the glass half full? or half empty. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation to speak today. Thank you so much. Um, really, that was such a nice introduction, especially pretending that Santa Fe was only 10 years ago. I'm sure it was much longer <laughs> ago, but uh, thanks a lot uh, for a very it's nice like introduction. It, like, yeah, no, thank you uh, much. Okay, so no. um, yeah. Before we start, you know, uh, we Sorry. would love to hear more about our speakers and there's so much I think we can learn from you today. Uh, so something that I would really appreciate to discuss with you is, you know, you are a world leader in understanding the immune response to parasites and you have successfully combined what is like really state-of-the-art techniques uh, with field work, right? And I'm sure we have many attendees that would love to learn more from you, what are the opportunities and the challenges of this quite special approach that you have taken? Do you mind sharing that with us before you start with your scientific? Of course. Well, I think, you know, what we know about the immune system is what we study in populations in Europe, in North America, you know, more the high income countries uh, and that immune system 
uh, that we study very intensely is only half the story, to be honest. Because if we move a bit further and look at the rest of the world and populations living in other parts of the world with very many different exposures to microorganisms and parasites, but also other lifestyles, I think we'll see that the immune system, actually a normal immune system can be very different in different places. So uh, one thing is it's great to go and you know, look at uh, host parasite interaction because you also look at places where these infections are highly prevalent and that's not in, you know, Europe or North America. So I think we are, the advantage is that we really get a good understanding of the immune system, not only part of it, it's, it's the whole picture we get. So that's the advantage, I would say. Uh, and then the disadvantages, is of course, there's a lot less money funding for work, for example, in um, neglected tropical diseases, which affect um, the low to middle income countries. So that's, of course, a setback. Um, and uh, sometimes it's quite challenging to do studies there because, um, you know, the, the, the infrastructure can be quite poor. But I think if you're determined to study something, you can get there. Uh, so that's my conviction. One of the other positive things is that there are many, many talented people. Uh, all over the world. And that's so wonderful to go there and discover all these talented people and work together. So that's, I've always enjoyed it anyway. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. Thanks for your commitment mm -hmm. and your perseverance. I mean, what you have done is tremendous. So we really look forward to learning more about your findings. Thank you so much. If you want, yes. you can now share your screen. I, I have shared. Can you see? Yes, it? you do. Sorry. Oh, I see okay. it. Yeah, no, no, no. We can see it perfectly. All right, wonderful. So, um, yeah, the title was already uh, mentioned, so thanks for that. And uh, I always like to also say there's this famous saying uh, in uh, the field of parasitology that parasites have done more for the immune system than the immune system has done for parasites. So we've learned a lot about the immune system by studying parasites. Th1, Th2 came through studying parasites, for example, regulatory T cells, part of it was also discovered through parasites that cause chronic infections. So with that, uh, maybe not everybody is uh, familiar uh, with parasites. So uh, I need to move. Mm, uh, I can't move right now. If you go to the lower left, sometimes you can see, let's see, there, yes, let's see, yeah, if you press the arrow to go ahead, the second, the second. Oh, item. okay, yes. oh, okay, thank there. you, <laughs> all right. Uh, okay, so uh, parasitic infections are um, mainly prevalent in um, uh, low to middle income countries throughout, uh, it's shown here, more than a quarter, a third of the world population is affected by parasites. And they come in many different shapes and forms. Uh, these are the protozoa, uh, so unicellular, you can have parasites, uh, you can have more complex ones. Uh, so malaria is the most famous of the protozoa and parasites, I would, I would think, um, uh, depending on where you are, uh, it's a major killer. Uh, we do study them, but today I'm going to mainly share uh, stories on the helminth infection, studies of host parasite interactions, but then mainly with helminths. And these are multicellular complex uh, organisms that really can, uh, can, can be microscopic uh, in size or even up to 18 meters long uh, and very fascinating organisms. And as you said uh, in the introduction, uh, it's always been nice to combine field studies with, you know, some uh, immunology and uh, some of the places that we visit are, are extremely remote uh, and we have to, you know, tr you transport all kinds of uh, hundreds, of, hundreds of kilos of stuff to go and establish a, a laboratory in the field uh, and, you know, some of them we, we use very little, if there's no electricity you have to just do with a torch, for example, to do microscopy. Um, but, you know, there's always been a great team of people who work together in these field studies. And here, sometimes we have to really um, have combined many, many different types of transports. Uh, you know, here is a picture of a car trying to go across a river, for example, to reach a tiny plane really dangerous, flying over the blood samples that are to be immunologically analyzed to get to a bigger plane. And then when you're in a, in a, in a city, you have to get the 
all the samples transported to a proper laboratory. But in the end, you get there and sometimes it takes quite a few 12 hours to have the blood samples taken and flown to a laboratory where you can isolate the peripheral blood nucleus. Some of the work has been trying to, uh, you know, sample things under difficult conditions and still try to get a lot of information out of it. Uh, I might be able to cover that in a minute. So you don't always have to just take pre PBMCs, but there are also other ways of preserving whole blood, uh, which is then easier to transport. One of the earliest studies was, you know, when we were looking at chronic helminth infections in Indonesia, that was filariasis, and so one of the oldest slides that I have, or data slides that I have. And basically what we showed, uh, for example, in areas where filarial infections in Indonesia were prevalent, we saw people who are exposed to the infection, they're living in a, in a village, for example, where filariasis is endemic, and uninfected people were exposed, we looked at their T cell responses and compared them to people who are infected. And we always see that if you stimulate uh, the cells, that you see that there is hyper-responsiveness of the T cells in infected individuals. So T cells are not responding that well in these infected individuals, where those who live in the area are sensitized to the parasite, but they don't carry them, they have stronger T cell responses. So is this because of the parasite or other factors? Well, you can do treatment. So here is studies in Gabon, and she's in Africa, where schistosomiasis is highly endemic. And there, if you look at the T cell responses, when of, of children who are carrying these infections, you see uh, low responsiveness. And when you do treatment and remove the helminths, then you see the T cell responses of the same individuals goes up after treatment. So that really indicates that uh, it is the presence of the helminth that is downregulating the immune system. So what else does it do? Chronic helminth infection is associated with that regulation of, of T cell responses, but it's also associated with Th2 skewing. Helminths are uh, great Th2 skewers. And you can see that here, if you stimulate uh, blood of individuals in Europe and you measure Th2 cytokines, you see very little uh, Th2 production. And if you go to Indonesia or to Gabon in areas where helmets are highly endemic, uh, you find a great expansion of Th2 cells in these areas. So a lot of IL-4 could be measured. Uh, and if you look at uh, the products of Th2 response, Ig is in Ophelia. I'll show you some slides of the Ig response across uh, in, in some populations in, in villages where helminths are endemic. And if you look at the total Ig levels, uh, you see in Europe or in, you know, in, in I guess North America, the, if people don't have allergic diseases, you have a total Ig of up to 100 international units per ml. And above that, it usually indicates that you have some allergic disease, for example, rhinitis, asthma, or atopic dermatitis. Patients with atopic dermatitis have very high levels of total Ig. And when we are in, in an area where helminths are endemic, data from either Indonesia or Gabon or, or, or Africa in helminth endemic areas, you see that the population, if you look at the total Ig response, it's quite elevated. It can be, you know, definitely above 100, but about the levels that we see here uh, that asthmatic patients have. So there's a huge expansion. This is not patients. These are people who are carrying helminth infections, and now that's the norm because almost everybody is infected with helminths in some of these areas. And this happens very early as well. It's incredible. This is really one of my favorite slides because it's very simple. And I think it really indicates how the immune system can be very different depending where you are. So this is a birth cohort study of uh, children in Indonesia, six week old versus five months, one year old, two year old and four year olds. And you look at the total Ig response, tiny amount of blood. And what you see is, whereas in Europe, of the same age group, the, the Ig levels that are normal are given in this red line. It's about three international units per ml. And for adults, we just saw is 100 international units per ml. And a child that is, of, is one year of age has already got much more total Ig in its blood above what is seen in adults. And by two years, almost everybody has Ig levels above the 100 international units per ml. So, and these children, you know, it's not as though there's something wrong with them, but their immune system is very different than what we see here. These are huge total Ig levels. So what about, how do we know Ig? We know Ig from allergic diseases, right? So 
basically you have Th2 and Th2 cytokines, you get Ig and mesenophilia, mast cells, and then uh, mast cells can have Ig you know, on their receptor on, on Ig receptors. And when the allergen comes along, it stimulates, it crosslinks the Ig and it causes degranulation, and that leads to symptoms. So we saw a lot of Th2, and the question was, are helminths that are associated with such Th2 response calling, causing allergies or not? And this is, you know, again, uh, work that, that's really about, you know, is the glass half empty or half full? I mean, is it good to have parasites or is it bad to have these helminths? What happens to helminth-infected individuals who have a lot of Th2 response? Are they very allergic or not? So you can do a skin prick test uh, reactivity. It's a field applicable uh, test where you can uh, put a lot of people get these uh, allergy tests to see whether they're allergic to something. And you can place the allergen uh, on the arm and then you can prick and you can see uh, uh, histamine you also put as a positive control. And then you can see whether people are allergic to different allergens. And you can mark this very simply with a marker pen, put a sellotape and get a record of it and put it on a piece of paper. And you can easily calculate whether somebody is allergic, positive to histamine and negative to negative control, and then uh, whether they're allergic to an allergen or not. And if we do this, we've done this in many places and others as well. We're not the only ones, of course, many people have done such studies. And uh, if you go to Siberia, where there is a trematode so that is highly prevalent there uh, versus Gabon or, or in Ghana or uh, Indonesia. We've done these studies as well. Basically what you see, skin pretest reactivity to allergens. If you do this in children in Europe, it's about 40% of children will be positive to some sort of allergen. When you look at these countries where helminths are prevalent, you see much lower levels of skin reactivity to allergens. So people are less allergic to these allergens. But there's also a difference in people who are carrying the helmet. We consistently see less skin prick test reactivity to the allergens in people who are carrying helmet infections. And so these people have a lot of TH2, but their, their, their responses to allergens are actually suppressed compared to those that do not carry helmet infections. So there is TH2 skewing in rural areas of a lot of the low to middle income countries. There is a lot of TH2 skewing. However, this TH2 skewing does not lead to more allergy. So the question was, are the TH2s very different in these areas? Are the cells different, uh, TH2 cells? Because there was a paper uh, uh, published in Science Translational Medicine in 2017, which indicated that the TH2 cells that are uh, are really um, aggressive and pathogenic, they express CD161 uh, on their surface. So these, taking from this, we thought we will characterize to see maybe helminth uh, induced Th2 cells do not are, are, have a different phenotype. So we've used mass cytometry, and so you know mass cytometry can really um, character can use up to we have now 40 antibodies that uh, can be used bound to metals. And when you put it through uh, uh, when you put the cells uh, uh, through a, a mass cytometer, what happens is the cells will break up, and each cell is passed through nebulized, and the metal Metals that are bound will be released and the metals can be measured um, precisely for the mass. So you know exactly what kind of antibodies are bound to that single cell. So this method is really great because there's little spectral overlap between the metals. So it allows you to use much more than is possible with conventional flow cytometry. And using this, you can really in one uh, go really characterize at the same time, because you can use so many markers, uh, not only the major lineages, but also within the lineages, you can really focus on um, subsets and clusters of cells with different activation differentiation markers. So having done that, you can then look also here to total PBMC, you look at the different lineages, you take the CD4s, and then you see when you characterize the CD4s, you can find the TH2, and then look at the characteristics of the TH2. And if you look at the TH2 that comes from Europeans, this is the picture of the cells that are there that looks like. And then if you take the, the 
uh, people who are from rural area of Indonesia infected with helminths, you can then treat and, 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 and look at whether in helminth negatives, what is different between helminth positive and negatives. And what you see is very quickly look at that. In rural areas of Indonesia, indeed, there is a lot more TH2 response compared to Europeans, you can see that, but there is also some difference between helminth positives and negatives, so before treatment and after treatment. You can see that the changes uh, where, whether you have you carrying a helminth or not, not hugely, might be already that cells have already are there if you have been infected before or there are other things that are contributing to this TH2 response. So when you look at it you can see a lot of clusters uh, of TH2 clusters can be identified as you saw on the other uh, slide on the previous slide and then uh, not all of these clusters are associated with helminth infections uh, because if you look, you, if you look, so we were interested to see whether in helminth infections CD161 positives are maybe not associated with helminth infections, but they, they are just like in allergy, in the allergic pathogenic uh, cells, the, the CD4 TH2 cells are here also expressing CD161 and, and they, after treatment, they go down uh, as you can see also with the TH2 to cytokine producing cells. So it's not that, I mean, we cannot say the same type of CD161 positive T cells are present in helmet infected individuals like they were in allergic subjects. They, uh, the pathogenicity, we have to maybe uh, look at more carefully, but they are producing these TH2 cytokines. There are other clusters that we are also um, trying to characterize uh, to see whether they are more associated, that could be more associated with allergic patients because we need to do this in allergic individuals. So again, back to, you know, what is it? So it's not the characteristic of the TH2. Is there something else that is stopping this development of allergic diseases? And I want to go back to studies from a long time ago where we looked at regulatory responses. We were wondering whether helminths are suppressing the um, a, the immune system in such a way that there is less allergy. And this is a study that was conducted in Gabon, where we looked at the levels of mite-specific IgE on one axis, and then the levels of IL-10, interleukin-10, in response to parasite, and um, skin reactivity. And for um, if, if you have more mite-specific Ig, you get more skin reactivity, right? So the more Ig, the more reactivity in your skin. However, this changes depending on how much IL-10 is produced. Uh, if a child can produce a lot of IL-10, for a given amount of mite-specific Ig, you get a smaller reactivity to skin, uh, you have less people, uh, you have less, you're less likely to be skin pricked as reactive to mite. So if you have IgE to, to mite, but you also have good capacity to produce IL-10, you're not, a, you will not develop a strong skin reactivity. So there is a link between this suppressory cytokine, uh, the regulatory cytokine and the lack of allergy. And we've looked at this further by characterizing regulatory TMB cells. I'm showing you the work from regulatory T cells, where you can have the, schist the, the schistosoma hematobium, so schistosome infected people before and after treatment. Um, so uh, here is the negatives and here is the schisto infected people. And what you see is that the regulatory T cells are higher in schistosome infected individuals. When you give treatment six weeks to seven months follow-up, we followed up and looked at the same individuals to see what happens to the regulatory T cells. And you see that the regulatory T cell numbers go down when you remove the parasite. And they re can remain low for quite a, for seven months in this case. We've also characterized at the molecular level the transcription of uh, the pr transcriptional profiles of the um, of the peripheral blood mononuclear cells, and what we found is that also um, transcription factors that are associated with T cell energy are higher when individuals are infected with schisto. And after treatment, this transcription of profiles changes, and the degree of uh, the, the transcription factors associated with energy disappear, dis decrease substantially. 
So this you know, all published work, but showing that regulatory T cells are indeed associated with helminth infections and can suppress before belt allergic reactivity. The regulatory T cells in intestinal helminth infections. So these are mainly affecting the intestine where schisto is in peripheral blood. We also looked at large deworming program and we characterized the regulatory cells. And here, what you see is um, in the dotted line is, so if there is uh, the, the placebo arm, so there's a placebo controlled uh, trial. And in the placebo arm, the levels are, you know, given in the, in the broken line. And what happens after treatment? Nine and 21 months after treatment, you see a change in regulatory cells, but it's really the CTLA-4 positive cells that are decreasing significantly. And this really shows that the inhibitory marker CTLA-4 is a very important inhibitor molecule in, um, on, on cells that can regulate the immune system when we're dealing with intestinal helminth infections. Uh, so it really depends. I don't think we can say all regulatory cells behave the same way in all helminth infections. Some of them have the CD4 positive, FOXB3 positive cells that are changing, and some of them have CD4 cells um, that have the CTLA4 positive, uh, CTLA4 expression on them as a result of helminth infection. We've also characterized the Tregs. Uh, using mass cytometry more recently. And uh, basically here you are, if you look at FOXB3 positive cells, this is the intestinal helminth infected individuals. And indeed, if you just do the classical, you know, uh, looking at the classical phenotype of Tregs with FOXB3 and CD25 high, you don't see a difference between Europeans and Indonesians in rural area and no difference pre and post treatment. However, if you go further and characterize it with CT CLA for an ICOS expression. So here, the further phenotyping of these cells, many clusters of Treg can be identified, but it is those that express CTLA4 and ICOS that really change, um, uh, that are higher in uh, people in rural areas of Indonesia compared to Europeans and change after treatment, that decrease after treatment. So in the previous, in the study that I just showed, where we did the large deworming program, uh, we really, we didn't look at CTLA-4 expressing T-Rex. So that's something that, you know, that's the advantage of having uh, high dimensional uh, that, that cytometry possibility, because then you can add many more markers and can get a better idea of which cells are changing. Not all T-Rex change, but certain subset changes. We're also interested in what are the IL-10 producing cells. So IL-10 producing cells, uh, we, so we took all the cells that are making IL-10 and we characterized them. And what we found um, that uh, CD11C positive B cells uh, in, in, in rural Indonesia, uh, they're very high compared to Europeans. Uh, however, they do not change after treatment. So they are associated with rural living but they do not seem to be associated per se with helminth infection. When you take the helminths away, they are still there. So there were, something else is driving this, um, these cells. Uh, there are also several IL-10 producing CD40 cells uh, that we could identify and uh, that are higher and are expanded in Indonesians that are residing in these rural areas where helminths are highly prevalent, uh, but only one of the few clusters that we identified decreased after treatment. So there's a lot of inhibitory cells there, uh, regulatory cells there, but they're not uh, necessarily driven all by helmet infection, by current helmet infections. So I just want to relate this presence of TH2 and regulatory cells to another group of, uh, of, uh, of uh, another uh, uh, disease indicating that having a helmet might be helpful. And that is for type two diabetes. And this became because people started characterizing the adipose tissue and, and trying to understand insulin resistance. And in the insulin sensitive subject, uh, the adipose tissue carries actually Treg, T 
TH2 ILC2. So type 2 and regulatory responses are more prominent in insulin sensitive adipose tissue. And as obesity uh, sets, uh, kicks in, you see that there is a change in the adipose uh, tissue and, uh, um, and the cells that are present there. Those become much more pro inflammatory, TH1. Uh, and, and M1 macrophages and insulin resistance develops. So what we were, you know, basically the balance of Th2 Treg uh, is really distorted in an obese individual who is insulin resistant. And when we read about these uh, these uh, issues, we asked the question whether. Uh, in areas in Indonesia where we were working with the salt transmitted helminths, uh, which are associated with type 2 responses or regulatory responses, but would the insulin sensitivity be affected? And when we compared those that were negative for helminths and those that were positive for helminths, we saw home IR is an indicator of a degree of insulin sensitivity, insulin resistance. You see that insulin resistance is actually more in those that are, that are not carrying helminths compared to those that are having helminths. So this seems to be beneficial. Those that are carrying helminth infections have less insulin resistance, which might be in line with the expanded TH2 or Tregs. Uh, but that is really association. So we did a, another large deworming program uh, with many households, uh, household-based randomized uh, trial. Um, and then we looked at what happened to insulin sensitivity. It's a bit of a complex uh, maybe way of showing the data uh, for some immunologists. But, you know, basically, if you treat uh, what we saw is insulin resistance after treatment. This is comparison before and after treatment. So. If you're on this side of this line, that means it, uh, you have, uh, and if the, the, if the whiskers don't cross this line, there's a significant increase in insulin resistance after deworming. But the, the amount is, seems to be different because if you have uh, no infection, there's no change because this line crosses this dotted line. So there's no significant difference in insulin uh, resistance when you have no infection. If you have single infection, starts moving towards insulin resistance, but it's not significant. However, if you have multiple helminth infections, that's where there's a, when, you, when you do treatment, it's this group that starts uh, getting more insulin resistance. And uh, one of the main reasons why the insulin resistance increases is because the body mass index actually increases. So helminths are there, they eat your food, and by eating your food, they control body mass index and also insulin sensitivity. However, there was also an association, a little bit of this change could be accounted for by change in eosinophil, which might be a proxy for Th2 response. And, you know, if you look at this, you say, oh, helminths are, you know, basically eating your food and therefore they're not letting you develop insulin resistance. Well, we decided to look at this by in animal models where you can actually put mice on a high fat diet to induce insulin resistance. And you could treat these mice with helminths, total helminths, but that would also eat the food and therefore could help to improve insulin, uh, to, to increase insulin resistance. So we decided we will look at not live worms, but extracts of worms and single molecules that we know can stimulate towards TH2. And if we do that, what we see is that indeed in a lean mice where insulin, the glucose can be uh, controlled very well, here's the blood glucose when you give a bolus, they can control their levels of glucose very well in low fat diet in mice. But in the high fat diet mice here, you can see they cannot control their glucose as well, this black line. And if you give them a total extract of schistosoma um, egg antigens is the red uh, line, which is, you know, basically your can control the glucose levels a bit better than the high fat diet only uh, animals. And if you take an extract, um, a, a parasite molecule that's very good inducing a TH2 response, you see that single molecule can also lead to improved control of <coughs> glucose homeostasis. 
So basically, uh, you don't need the whole animal to uh, con to to improve uh, insulin sensitivity. You don't need the whole uh, helmet to improve the uh, uh, the insulin resistance, but uh, even single molecules that can induce TH2 uh, can do that. So, um, but not all TH2 inducing molecules, we've, we've done a lot of this work, and uh, not all TH2 inducing molecules can improve glucose tolerance. So it's again, not as simple as, you know, I cannot give you a, complete, a very simple story, but there, is, there are intricacies to this whole thing. And uh, right now, uh, uh, there's a lot of effort to identify molecules that can modulate allergic diseases and type 2 diabetes because you don't usually want to give people the worm, but you want to get the extracts and then use those to treat some of these diseases. So that's to uh, capitalize on the good uh, properties of helmets. But I want to show that the glass is never always uh, half full, but it can also be half empty. And this is in relation to um, responses to vaccines. So whereas, uh, you know, inflammation is controlled during chronic illness infection, you don't get an overt reaction to allergens, you control your insulin sensitivity better <clears throat> because you control inflammation. But the same uh, status is of course detrimental when you want to induce a good vaccine response because you want some level of inflammation to get a good vaccine response. And we know that some vaccines uh, have shown blunted uh, immune responsiveness in uh, people who live in areas where parasitic infections are highly prevalent. I'll show you a couple of examples. Here is uh, a poor malaria vaccine response in children that had helminth infection. So this is a, a, a GMZ2, is a candidate malaria candidate vaccine uh, made up of uh, GLRP and MSP3. And if you look at the red uh, bars, these are the uh, children uh, uh, who uh, received the vaccine and they're either uh, free of trichuris, a helminth infection, versus children that were positive for helminth infection. And every time, if you look at the, these are the antibody responses to these vaccine components, and what you see that children that were free of helminths, they were doing better in terms of antibody responsiveness. So in this case, having a helminth was detrimental. You did not mount as good a response to the vaccine. We also did some studies uh, on influenza, uh, for example, and if you look at the titers of influenza, we, we vaccinated children in Gabon um, in, and, and looked at urban and rural areas, and what we saw there was a difference in antibody titers, the straight line, the, the solid line is urban and the broken line is rural, response of rural children to influenza, you see lower response to influenza vaccine in the rural areas, and if you analyze the uh, cellular responses, what you see is that there is more pro-inflammatory TNF and gamma production in response um, to influenza uh, in those that are in urban area, whereas the responses in the rural area are significantly lower. And more recently, malaria vaccines, the attenuated live malaria vaccines have been tested not only in Europe and America, but also in Africa. And here is, you know, what we see if you give this vaccine, this live malaria attenuated vaccine, in Europe, you can reach 100% efficacy. This is graph is showing people who develop malaria, who come, who become parasitemic um, uh, after being challenged with a malaria, given uh, malaria um, uh, intravenously. So um, in Europe, you can get 100% protection. But if you go, if you if you give uh, saline uh, control, that no protection, many develop parasitemia. But if you look at the two types of attenuated <coughs> vaccines, you only see 27% or 55% protection compared to 100% protection in Europe. So in Africa, you get a much less protective response than in Europe. So, you know, 
what exactly is it also the helmet or the other things so we need to look at the in-depth analysis of the immune cells we wanted to see what is this different rural urban difference africa and europe and we've again used um, mass cytometry to characterize for example people who live in in rural areas of senegal versus in dakar the capital city and then again with people who are in leiden and what you see is really there is for some of these cells, you, you see a gradient where actually the urban Dakar people in, in Senegal look much more like the European, like people in the Netherlands, than the rural areas. So there's a real gradient of the immune reactivity, the immune system, what it looks like in a rural area in Africa compared to urban area Africa, uh, compared to Europe. You could say Europe and Africa, you know, there's genetic differences, but the environment is having a big impact because you can see within Africa, there are big differences. And that could of course impact the response to vaccine. And in Indonesia, we've seen similar thing where, you know, here's the picture of the Netherlands, the immune cells that are characterized in the Netherlands. Here is Jakarta, people who live in the capital city of Indonesia, look almost similar to the ones in the Netherlands and rural areas are very showing a very different picture. Again, so it can't be genetics, but it's really much more the impact of environmental factors. And some of them, of course, are helmet infections because in all these rural areas, there's a lot of helmet infection, but there's also malaria, other parasitic infections, as well as other microorganisms. So I, I, I want to just say, you know, by doing in-depth analysis of the immune system, uh, not all we've seen that, you know, there's a lot of change due uh, in people that are helmet infected, but after treatment, not everything goes back to uh, the non-infected group or even to European. And the, the, the pattern of the immune system changes, but not always, and not all cell subsets are, or clusters are associated with helmets, uh, but also other environmental factors are important. Um, I want to, I think I have a few minutes uh, that I want to, to talk about very quickly about uh, how we can further look at host parasite interaction, helminth interaction, but also malaria, we're doing that. And that is with controlled human infections, because these are models that allow you to know exactly uh, somebody is given a parasite and how does the immune response, the immune system respond to this parasite in intervals. And, and, and this is for, I will give you an example of the hookworm infection model, where hookworm uh, positive donor from Australia, the thesis was actually, the, the donor was invited to come to the Netherlands so we can, you know, uh, this Australian uh, um, uh, person who was infected um, to come and donate uh, some feces samples so we could isolate the the larvae. At some stage, he had to go back to Australia and we had to ship stool samples from Australia to the Netherlands to, you know, get this system going. So you isolate basically from the eggs the infected larvae and then you put it on the gauze and then put it on the arm and then after 30 to one hour, uh, 30 minutes to one hour, you can actually see where the larvae have penetrated the skin and the person becomes infected. You can see is an affiliate develops. These are the first four people that were infected. And we've started just now to look at the um, immune system using mass cytometry. And we see that, you know, before infection here, uh, after is the immune components separating before and after infection and it goes up to you know it goes for a long time so we have up to two years of infection so we are now looking at acute and chronic stages of infection and then we can compare to what extent this also overlaps with what we see in endemic countries to understand the other environmental impacts on the immune system the all ongoing work. So I just want to then share some thoughts. Uh, I mean, I think for us in any case, for helmet infections and other environmental factors, this includes other microorganisms, viruses, bacteria, they shape the immune system and they seem to fix the set point at which the immune system can react. So, you know, we really need to learn a lot more about the heterogeneity of cells because we do see, you might, 
all CD4 cells might not respond to a certain uh, uh, um, intervention, but when you really break it down and look at certain subsets or clusters, you identify within there uh, the, the, the cells that can make a difference. And we need to really know how these different clusters are, are involved in the positive and the negative aspects of this set point, because the positive side is that we don't react to allergens or we are, you know, or maybe to autoantigens, but uh, we don't maybe develop uh, um, type 2 diabetes, but the negative side is that, uh, you know, we don't respond well if we have a helmet infection. So we need to really understand even more. Again, more research is needed, unfortunately. It keeps us busy for a while. But with that, uh, I'll leave you there. And, and I just want to acknowledge people who've contributed. Many, many people, not all of them are here. Um, but currently, many talented people are working and looking at this high-dimensional uh, analysis. Um, the diabetes work uh, was by Patrick from the Many ex-members who are still publishing uh, and are uh, past clinical parasitology group. Uh, the controlled human infection model set up by Meta Rustenberg is always a great asset and all our wonderful collaborators, particularly the international ones, I want to thank them. And of course, all the study populations and thank you for listening. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, that was excellent. We know how hard it must be to set up all these collaborations to do this incredible work in the field and combine it with state-of-the-art technologies. It's also impressive to see that you have established infections in volunteers. No. <laughs> I would love to learn more. And, about and that's, that's both helmets and malaria and, you know, and also other things. Yeah, we have a center of controlled human uh, infection models. Yeah. yeah, I look forward to learning more about that as <laughs> the time goes by. But before we leave, Elena will remind us how people can ask questions because the questions are via Twitter, right? Yes, and um, yeah, I agree. That was a terrific talk, Maria. Thank you so much. Great work. Um, very inspirational. Um, okay, so uh, if you'd like to ask uh, questions to Maria, go to the Global Immunotalk account. You will find a tweet that says, ask questions for Maria here. And she will reply using the account uh, loopsipara. So this one written here. And um, yeah, thank you, Maria, again, uh, for, for educating us about uh, parasite immunology and, and how the immune response is different in different parts of the world. That, that was very uh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for inviting. Yeah, appreciate it. And uh, we hope to see everyone uh, next week uh, for Ana Domingo's uh, presentation. And uh, yeah. Uh, enjoy the rest of the week. Yeah. See you bye. next week. Bye, Maria. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Thanks.